questions. Question oral, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Today, there is once again a human tragedy underway because of huge and apparently unpredictable increases in interest rates that will force Canadians to sell their homes or to default upon their payments. The Prime Minister promised that interest rates would remain low for a long time, but the government's expenditures have forced inf inflation up and therefore the Bank of Canada had to increase interest rates. What increase will the average family see in its uh, mortgage payments in the next three years? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Over the past few months, I've spoken to many Canadians who shared their concerns with me with regard to the cost of living and their worries about global inflation or their worries about the economic situation in which we are today. Of course, the Bank of Canada continues to do its work, but we will also continue to do our work with a number of non-inflationary um, measures that will help Canadian families, help for dental care for kids, working for low-income workers, investments for groceries. The leader of the official opposition, the governor of the Bank of Canada, indicated that this government's deficits are increasing inflation. The former Minister for Finance, the former Liberal Minister, stated that this Prime Minister's inflationary policies is putting the foot on the accelerator. It's hitting the gas for inflation, whilst the Bank of Canada is trying to hit the brakes. Mr. Speaker, we have the highest household debt level in G7 countries. Canadians can no longer pay for these deficits. Will he say at least what increase will be seen in mortgage payments in the next three years? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that Canadians are facing difficult times, and that is exactly the reason for which uh, this government is here to invest to help them in a targeted and non-inflationary way. The Conservative Party insists that we should send less assistance for low-income earners, less help for dental care for those who need it, less help for families with young children uh, in daycare. We will continue to be here to help Canadians weather these difficult storms, because that is our job. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Sucker punch. That's what Canadians receive from this Prime Minister. He promised them low interest rates for long. He said debt was without consequence and that the budget would balance itself. None of those things came true, and interest rates are now 19 times higher than they were a year ago. The Governor of the Bank of Canada, the former Liberal Finance Minister, countless other experts agree that the Prime Minister's deficits are ballooning inflation and therefore interest rates. Families have to plan their finances, so will he indicate how much Will the average family see their monthly mortgage payments go up over the next three years? How much? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, while the Bank of Canada continues to do its job to drive down inflation, which is going down, we will continue to do our job to be there to support Canadians, Canadians who need it, with investments in things like dental care, in a grocery rebate, in supports for low-income renters, and the kinds of things that Conservatives would be cutting instead. Canadians are hurting, and the Conservatives' answer is cuts to programs, cuts to supports for families, cuts to Canadians at a time they need it. Uh, austerity is not the answer, Mr. Speaker. Responsible fiscal approach is. That's exactly what we're doing by supporting Canadians who need it. Here, here. Leader of the Opposition. Actually, austerity is what, exactly what Canadians are feeling right. in their household budgets right. today, while the government budgets overflow with abundance. Mr. Speaker, there's already been a 16 percent year-over-year increase in the number of Canadians missing their mortgage payments. After eight years of this Prime Minister, we have the highest house household debt in the entire G7. Household debt is now 7 per cent higher than our entire GDP, Mr. Speaker. And now his inflationary deficits are shooting up interest rates. So how much 
will the average family have to plan to pay more in mortgage payments per month? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Straight, Mr. Speaker. Canada has the best debt-to-GDP ratio in the G7. We have the lowest deficit in the G7, but the Leader of the Opposition wants us to do far less to support Canadians who need it right now. That's exactly backwards, Mr. Speaker. Here, his pursuit of ideological gains uh, is uh, hurting Canadians. We are going to continue to be there in responsible, targeted ways, keeping our fiscal responsibility at the centre of what we do while we support Canadians in targeted, non-inflationary ways. That's what Canadians need right now. Here, here. The well, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, it's not just me anymore pointing out that deficits drive inflation. It's Liberals. It's the former Liberal Finance Minister, John Manley, who said that the Liberal deficits are a bit like driving your car with one foot on the gas and the other on the brake generally, especially if there's slushy conditions under your tires." End quote. He's pointing out that this Prime Minister presses his foot on the inflationary gas pedal while the Bank of Canada has to press on the brakes. The, the, the engine is eventually going to blow. We know Canadians cannot pay their bills. Will the Prime Minister be honest today and tell Canadians how much their mortgage payments will go up because of these rate hikes? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Let's use a specific example of what Ms. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition calls uh, inflationary spending. We made a decision that kids under 12 in this country shouldn't have to pay for dental care. Their families should be able to send them to the dentists. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Conservative politicians, who all have access to dental care uh, through the House of Commons supports uh, for their kids, don't think Canadians who can't afford to send their kids to the dentist should be doing that, and they say that's inflationary. Mr. Speaker, that approach around cuts and austerity is not what Canadians need. Here, here. The Honourable Member for, for Belle Chambly, Mr. Speaker, I ask the Prime Minister to listen to the special rapporteur that chose himself had to admit to a parliamentary committee that he tabled a report that contradicts testimony from a parliamentarian who was victim of intimidation and interference from China. He said that he drafted the report based on what he knew when he wrote it. He also had to admit that his report, therefore, was incomplete. A crucial report for the safety of Canadians and parliamentarians in the country. The writer now says that it is incomplete. The report is perhaps also biased, we've been told. Does the Prime Minister agree to put an end to Mr. Johnston's mandate? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we all know that the leader of the Bleu Québécois won't accept any answer I give today. But he has the opportunity of reading the answers himself. He has the opportunity to accept a briefing from our intelligence officers that will clarify all the thought process behind uh, the, governor, the former Governor General's report. The leader of the Bloc, like the leader of the Conservatives, refuses to accept these top secret briefings in order to understand the issue at hand and that is subjacent to our concerns. The Honourable Member for Baylor Chambly, I refuse to see in secret what should be seen by everyone. Mr. Speaker, what I propose to the Prime Minister is a uh, truce. If Parliament were to appoint an independent commissioner that would decide what is public or not, then we could move on to something else. However, we'll have to continue to ask relentlessly what justifies a Prime Minister keeping in position a report, uh, rapporteur who's his friend, a rapporteur who has admitted that the report is incomplete he didn't speak to the chief electoral officer, and he spoke. He didn't speak to the Chinese diaspora. The right honourable prime minister, the leader of the Bloc Québécois, has just said that he refuses to see in secret what should be published. Now I understand that he's devoted to his position in the opposition, and he doesn't expect to govern anything in his life. But as a leader, as a parliamentarian, he should understand that his responsibility is to serve Canadians. And it gives him the opportunity 
if not the responsibility, to go to the very depths of what he can do. When it comes to national security, there are reasons for which certain things are secret and reasons why we have to be discreet. He has the opportunity to get this information himself. The Honorable Member for Burnaby South. Quite ironically, today is Clean Air Day, and Canada is burning. The air quality caused by forest fires is a danger for people with respiratory problems, for children and for pregnant women. We know that with global warming, we are going to see ever more forest fires. What will it take for the Prime Minister to finally realize that we have to act right now in order to save our environment? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I completely agree that today is a day of irony because we are Clean Air Day. It is Clear Air Day here in Canada. We see how these forest fires can affect us. Historic forest fires affect us. They will not be the worst to come. We know that it will get worse in the years to come. Here we are still having debates with the Conservative Party, notably, whether yes or not we should act in order to fight against climate change instead of how we can actually fight against climate change. The government will continue to fight against climate change and will continue to protect Canadians. South. It's clear that the government has not taken the climate crisis seriously. Their actions show that very clearly. Today is supposed to be clean air day. And at the same time, our country is burning. You can even smell the smoke in this chamber. Our country is literally on fire, and this Liberal government thinks that business as usual is fine. And we've got a Conservative government that's in full, a Conservative party that's in full denial mode. When will this Prime Minister realize we have to take this crisis seriously? We've got to protect our environment. We've got to protect the air for our kids, for our future. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, not only are we the government that has done more to fight climate change than any previous government in history, independent expert evaluators judged our environmental plan in the last election as being significantly stronger even than the NDP's environmental plan. Unfortunately, we're caught in a debate where Conservatives are still arguing whether or not we should be fighting climate change instead of contributing to a debate around how to best fight climate change. We've We've put forward a price on pollution that is changing corporate behaviors and driving down emissions. Conservatives stand against it, but they don't have anything to offer. The Honourable Member for Brantford, Brent. Mr. Speaker, yesterday David Johnston, the loyal rapporteur of this Prime Minister, his ski buddy, his cottage neighbour, his dinner companion, and member of the Trudeau Foundation, was incapable of seeing any conflict of interest. <laughs> now I can understand why our ethically challenged Prime Minister would be a oblivious to this, but for a lawyer, law professor, and dean of a law school, this is nothing but willful blindness. David Johnston has lost the trust of Parliament and Canadians. It's time to end the sham. When will this Prime Minister show Mr. Johnston the door and call for a public inquiry? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me quote. I think we're dealing in uh, the former Governor General with a very credible individual, and I think that distant history bears little relevance to the fact that he has a very distinguished career. If we're suggesting just because at some point in history he was appointed by a former Conservative Prime Minister that he should be disqualified from participating in public life, I think that's a bit extreme. This is a very qualified individual, and frankly, I haven't heard anybody question his integrity and I have no reason to do so. That, Mr. Speaker, was the leader of the opposition, the member for Carleton. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, the Special Rapporteur's mandate is all about Beijing's interference in our electoral process. In Canada, we have only one federal electoral process. We have only one democratic institution, and that is the election of members to this House of Commons. And three times in the past three months, this House has voted for an independent public inquiry. Yet the Special Rapporteur and the Prime Minister alone have rejected an inquiry. How can confidence and trust be restored in our democracy if the Prime Minister and government continue to defy the democratic will of this House? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I agree entirely with the member opposite that this is a very serious situation which we are facing. Unfortunately,
unfortunately, the leader of the Conservative Party is not taking this seriously. The Conservative Party is looking for occasions to make personal attacks and toxic partisan attacks instead of actually looking at the question of foreign interference with the level of responsibility necessary. If the leader of the opposition was serious about it, he would accept the top secret briefings from our intelligence agencies that, un that explain the underpinnings of the conclusions in the Johnston report, and he would be able to weigh in responsibly. Here, here. The Honourable Member for St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister's loyal rapporteur was asked to reconcile his conclusion that the spreading of disinformation in the 2021 election could not be attributed to the Beijing regime with the CSIS briefing to the former leader of the Conservative Party that said the opposite. The rapporteur said that he based his conclusion on evidence that he had at the time, evidence that was provided by this government. So, did the rapporteur ignore material evidence, or did this government withhold it from him? Which one is it? Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, that evidence is available to the leader of the opposition if only he were to accept a top secret briefing that he prefers to refuse so he can continue his baseless personal attacks against an eminent Canadian. But further than that, Mr. Speaker, it is a panel of expert public, ser uh, public se service officials who determined both in 2019 and 2021 that the election integrity held mechanisms that this government put in place that that previous governments never bothered with. That's how we know the integrity of the elections in 2019 and 2021 held. That's right. The Honourable Member for St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, a report of the government's rapid response mechanism identified that Beijing-controlled social media accounts were spreading disinformation in the 2021 election targeting the Conservative Party, including an account with 26 million followers. And yet, incredibly, the rapporteur concluded otherwise. He ignored the report, he ignored the evidence, and instead whitewashed Beijing's interference. The conclusions of the rapporteur have no credibility. Will the Prime Minister fire him and finally call an independent public inquiry? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. These are the conclusions of the top public officials who had the task during the 2021 and 2019 elections to monitor the foreign interference that has been ongoing in this country for years and years against with the former Minister of Elections for the Conservatives, the current leader, did nothing. We established a protocol whereby the, uh, the integrity of those elections were evaluated and reported on those integ that integrity held. Now, if the Conservatives think the integrity of the elections didn't hold in 19 or 21. Let them say so, Mr. Speaker. That's right. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Megantic Lérable. The Prime Minister's good friend closed his eyes on crucial information to avoid having to make a recommendation that there should be a public and transparent inquiry. He did not talk to the Chief Electoral Officer. He didn't talk to the MP for Don Valley West. He didn't talk, he didn't read a CSIS report sent to the member for Durham. No reports on various links to the CCP. Nothing about Beijing's police stations, nothing about the Trudeau Foundation. After this uh, terribly partisan demonstration, will the Prime Minister finally announce today that there will be a public and independent inquiry? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. The Conservative Party just wants to carry out personal attacks against the former Governor General who was appointed by, by Stephen Harper at the time. He wants to carry out partisan attacks to score political points. But the reality of the matter is that if the Conservatives really wanted to take the issue seriously, that everyone should take seriously, then the Conservatives would accept the top secret briefing that was offered to the leader of the official opposition so that they can understand the facts behind the decisions that have been made by the former Governor General, the Honourable Member for Megantic Lérable. If the Prime Minister was serious, he would listen to the majority of MPs in this House, Mr. Speaker. David Johnson had one thing to do, one thing to do to convince Canadians to show that there is absolutely no conflict of interest between him and the Prime Minister. He 
completely failed by confirming every single conflicts of interest that would make him ineligible to receive the trust of this uh, House and of Canadians. When will the Prime Minister finally do the honourable thing and put an end to the pains of his friend, the former Governor-General, by allowing him to step down? The right honourable Prime Minister. As was recently explained, recently in newspapers, the best way to hamper an inquiry is to discredit the inquirers and the investigators. That is what the official opposition is doing. But it's not the Conservatives who invented this. This is a tactic directly from the playbook of Donald Trump. They're tackling investigators because they don't want to talk about the actual facts and the serious conclusions of the matter. To take this more seriously is what we all have to do and what we expect from the official opposition. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, whilst the Prime Minister continues to protect liberal secrets and liberal powers, he is not protecting Canadians and people who have been oppressed by the Chinese regime. People that are threatened in China as a way to pressure Canadians. He's doing nothing on the matter this morning. Representatives from Taiwan, from the Uyghur Autonomous Territory, from Solomon Islands and Tibet asked for a public inquiry. Will the Prime Minister finally act like a head of state and accept this public inquiry? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, we know full well that the first targets of Chinese interference is the, uh, the first targets are the diaspora. That's why we'll defend these communities and they are at the heart of the decisions that we are making. I look forward to see the work done by the Governor General throughout Canada so that he can talk to various diasporas, so that he can make recommendations to the government so that we can continue to protect them. Unfortunately, there is more and more intolerance and racism since the pandemic, and that is why we'll continue to be here for these vulnerable people. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, it's not a diaspora. These are conquered people or people who are being conquered. There's a very dangerous file. We are, there should be a true independent commissioner. I don't want to be part of any liberal maneuver that uh, allows the government to keep things secret. So, and that means that Canadians would not get all the information they deserve to see. I will not be part of a system that will abandon people to the oppression of De Beijing and that does not protect Canada and Canada's democracy. Will the Prime Minister accept my proposal? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member knows full well that there are elements of national security that cannot be disclosed to the greater public, and that's the reality of life. There are people that work for the army, for CSIS, who jeopardize their own lives to unveil the secrets of countries that wish us harm. We have the leader of the Bleu Québécois, who could consult secret information to better understand what we can't publish, and he refuses to read this report. He prefers ignorance rather than facts. Now, I would like to remind the member for Lac saint jean that if he shouts in the ears of the member of Belle Chambly, then the latter won't be able to hear the answer. Just a little reminder. Asked by my associate finance shadow minister if, if deficits had been smaller, would inflation have been lower? And the Bank of Canada president answered, uh, uh, governor answered yes. He also said inflation in Canada is increasingly reflecting what's happening in Canada. Former Liberal Premier of Nova Scotia said on the inflation side, if governments both nationally and subnationally continue to spend beyond their means, spending to pay 
the credit card of the government of today, they are going to continue to have inflation that continues to increase. If he won't believe me, will he at least believe his officials and his Liberal friends? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I believe this is the first time we've heard the Leader of the Opposition even indirectly criticize provincial governments that are racking up significant spending that is uh, inflationary. On the federal side, uh, we have been very cautious about targeting the measures so that they are not contributing to inflation, even as we continue to support Canadians, to support families, to support seniors, to support workers with measures that, on top of that, the Leader of the Opposition is excited about filibustering and blocking tonight. Mr. Speaker, we're going to be there to help low-income workers despite their political games. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, it's not just the Governor of the Bank of Canada who says deficits contribute to inflation. It's not just the former Liberal Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister John Manley who says that deficits contribute to inflation. It's his own actual Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. She said that inflation, that deficits pour fuel on the inflationary fire. And that's exactly what she did with this budget. $60 billion in additional inflation, that's $4,200 per family, which now has led to higher interest rates. Will he announce a plan and a deadline to balance the budget to bring down inflation and interest rates? Yeah. Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Bank of Canada is acting to bring down interest, uh, bring down uh, inflation, and it's working. Our inflation is coming down. At the same time, our job as a government is to be there to support Canadians, to be there with supports for families, be there with supports for kids who need dental care, would be there for supports for Canadians who are struggling right now. The Conservative approach is to cut programs, to cut supports for Canadians, at the same time as we are standing up to help Canadians through this difficult time and out to the other side. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that uh, the Prime Minister's staff handed him a stale briefing note because inflation is actually rising. Right. It was up in the most recent reported month. Just so happens that that month followed the introduction of the $60 billion of brand new, above and beyond, inflationary spending by this minister. We now know that deficits contribute to inflation, which lay, raise interest rates. And he's right, the Bank of Canada is trying to bring down that inflation while he continues to pour the gas on the fire. Yeah. Will he stop that irresponsible practice and deliver a balanced budget to bring down inflation and interest yeah. rates? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, at least the op Leader of the Opposition is consistent in not letting facts get in the way of a good political argument. Whether it's on climate change, whether it's on foreign interference, or whether it's on uh, the Bank of Canada and inflation, he's continuing to fearmonger, he's continuing uh, to, uh, to amplify uh, erroneous fears that Canadians have at the same time as we are delivering supports in a targeted way. We have the lowest deficit of any G7 country. We have the lowest debt-to-GDP ratio of any G7 country. We are continuing to be there for Canadians in a non-inflationary way that is targeted and right. The Leader of the Opposition. Erroneous fears? Wow. Mr. Speaker, tonight... Families will sit down with their kids at their dining room table to say, sorry, we have to sell the house. Yeah. Because mortgage payments are going to go up by as much as $1,500 uh, per month. That's not me. That's according to the Bank of Canada, which predicts a 40% increase in mortgage payments. People can't pay 15 grand more in mortgage payments. They have only 200 bucks left in the bank at the end of the month. Will the Prime Minister acknowledge that these are real fears by real people and stand on their side? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker where the Leader of the Opposition falls down is his solution for those families 
is to do less for them, to take away their child care, to take away their dental care, to take away the programs that are helping them, like the Canada Workers Benefit. We are bringing forward payments for the Canada Workers Benefit so that low-income workers can get more help right now, and that leader is going to stand up for hours tonight and block that measure, Mr. Speaker. There is help for Canadians on the way, and those Conservatives are standing in the way with silly procedural games. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Today marks the ninth rate increase since March 2020. It's, star it's starting, to get, starting to get noisy again. I'm going to ask everyone to take a deep breath and just quiet down. I'm going to ask the Honourable Member for uh, Burnaby South to start from the top. Today marks the ninth interest rate increase since March 2022. For families on a stretch budget, this means a lot more pain. But more and more economists have coming to the consensus, something that neither Conservatives nor the Liberals are willing to talk about, that the greed of CEOs exploiting yep. this inflationary crisis to jack up profits is the major cause of inflation. So will this Prime Minister finally take greedflation seriously and stop greedy CEOs from gouging Canadians? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the global inflation crisis uh, that faces Canadians and people around the world has global roots, whether it's the war in Ukraine that Putin is responsible for, whether it's coming out of the pandemic. We can say that Canada's economic recovery uh, has been much faster than it was during the much shallower recession in 2008 under the previous government, uh, that employment is up higher than it's ever been, uh, but at the same time, too many Canadians are hurting, and that's why we've been stepping up with targeted supports that aren't increasing inflation but are responding to the reality of Canadians who are struggling. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. My question was about greenflation and again the Liberals and the Conservatives neither of them have the courage to talk about it. During this difficult time, economists are warning that interest rate hikes could lead Canada to a recession. With yet another increase, people will have even more trouble making ends meet every month. Meanwhile, multinationals and grocery giants like Metro are raking in the profits. Will the Prime Minister finally tax excessive profits that are being made by his billionaire friends? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we all know that Canadians are facing challenges financial challenges, and that is why we are taking action. We are taking action to support them with investments like the grocery rebate, with assistance for low-income workers, and assistance for low-income re renters, dental care for families that can't send their kids to the dentist. We are there with targeted non-inflationary assistance. We are helping people while the Conservatives are once again pushing austerity. A lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, as Canada continues to recover from the pandemic, it's important to make sure that no one is left behind. That's why our government has introduced programs like the Canada Child Benefit, $10 a day child care, the Canada Dental Benefit, and the grocery rebate. With us today in Ottawa are a group of single moms and their daughters from my riding in Mississauga Lakeshore. There are some of the millions of Canadians who have benefited from these programs. I'm proud that our government has delivered real action for families in my community. Unfortunately, the official opposition refused to support these measures that help Canadians get ahead. Can the Prime Minister please remind this House why it's important to help make life more affordable for families? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Mississauga Lakeshore for his question and his dedication to his constituents. We're all extremely proud of the accomplishments we've made since 2015, but we know there's a lot more to do. That's why our budget aims to make life more affordable for the middle class while creating great middle class jobs in a clean economy. However, Conservative politicians continue to block us from delivering these important measures. We hope they'll end their partisan games and help us send the BIA to the Senate this week. Here, here. The Leader of the Opposition. After eight years of this Prime Minister, he's not only doubled the national debt, adding more debt than all Prime Ministers combined, he's overseen a doubling in the average cost of rent, the average mortgage payment, 
and the average necessary down payment. Now, household debt in Canada is the worst of any country in the G7. In fact, our household debt in total is 7% bigger than the entire GDP of the country. And the IMF reports that we have the largest risk of mass defaults of all leading economies. Will the Prime Minister stop heaping on inflation and interest rate hikes now? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker. The Canadian government has the lowest deficit in the G7, the best debt-to-GDP ratio in the G7, and yet Canadians are struggling. And we propose to send them more direct help, including uh, with an ability to uh, discount, to uh, get tax refunds on, on, their, on their tools for tradespeople, uh, help with the Canada workers' benefit, other measures to help home buyers. And Conservatives say, no, we should be cutting programs. We should be sending less help to Canadians. Right. Is during this time. It's completely illogical and irresponsible, and yet they're standing up and blocking our budget. That's right. The leader of the opposition. He's not sending any help. Everything he spends, he has to take. It reminds us of when he said he was going to take on government debt so that Canadians wouldn't have to. Well, now they're stuck with twice the national government debt and the biggest household debt of any any country in the G7. At the time, the Prime Minister flooded the economy with cheap cash, which increased housing prices and therefore mortgage debt. Now Canadians have more debt than at any time in our history, more debt than the size of our entire economy, and they're hit with a 19-fold increase in interest rates. How will they ever pay their bills? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for every now and then, for the Conservative leader to remind us all that he wouldn't have been there to help Canadians through the depths of the pandemic. He wouldn't have been there to support families or small businesses or get our economy rolling again. He was part of the Stephen Harper government that let the 2008 pandemic linger for nine years before we recovered jobs, and yet this deeper recession had two years to bounce back to full employment. We are going to continue to be there for Canadians to support them while he's proposing cuts and less support for Canadians when they need it most. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. We were the last to go in and the first to come out of the great global recession. We left the country with a balanced budget and housing costs were half, half of what they are today. And not to mention that food price inflation never went above 4%. That is a far superior record to what this Prime Minister has delivered. He has doubled housing prices, doubled the cost of a mortgage, doubled rent costs, sent 1.5 million people running to the food bank. And now he proposes another $60 billion of inflationary deficits or $4,200 in extra cost to Canadians. Will he do what he promised to do just six months ago and give a date for a balanced budget? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, 2.7 million Canadians lifted out of poverty since 2015 because of supports and investments this government made. At the same time as we've seen millions of jobs created uh, and uh, the lowest unemployment in generations. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to be there in targeted, non-inflationary ways to help Canadians while the Conservatives continue to stand in the way of more help to Canadian families who need it right now. We have an approach that is growing the economy, creating great jobs, and supporting Canadians at the same time. Here, here. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. There he goes again, totally out of touch, says Canadians have never had it so good. Those 9 and 10 young people who have given up on ever owning a home, they've never had it so good, says the Prime Minister. The 1.5 million who are going to food banks or skipping meals. They've never had it so good. Those that are going to the Mississauga Food Bank seeking help with medical assistance and dying, not because they're sick, but because they're hungry, have never had it so good. What they are experiencing is the unavoidable mathematics of an inflationary government, which has spilled $500 billion of inflation on their backs. When will we balance the budget to bring down those costs? Before getting, I just want to remind the honourable members, just because they change sides and go to another part of the room doesn't mean I can't hear them. The honourable, right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, 
the fact of the matter is uh, we all in this House, representing constituents across the country, know that Canadians are hurting. The difference between our two approaches is we continue to be there in targeted, non-inflationary ways to help Canadians while Conservatives are proposing program cuts, support cuts, cuts to child care, cuts uh, to investments in dental care, cuts to the kinds of things that are help Canadian, helping Canadians through these difficult times. That's the choice Canadians are going to be making in a few years, between cuts and further responsible growth for the economy. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Yesterday, at the Committee on Chinese Interference, David Johnson confirmed that he based his report on only partial information. He didn't even take the time to speak to the Chief Electoral Officer or the Elections Commissioner. He didn't do the work he should have done, but he still concluded that we didn't need a public inquiry. Mr. Speaker, Ms. Mr. Johnson showed himself that his report was lacking in rigor and that his conclusions should be questioned. He himself discredited his own report. He disqualified himself from participating in future hearings. Will the Prime Minister finally dismiss him, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, I have already answered this question. The Bloc Québécois is continuing its personal partisan attacks. We will take a moment to recognize all the firefighters and other first responders who are fighting the fires in Quebec and elsewhere. We are seeing the worst year for fires impacting communities and people throughout the country. We will continue to be there. Today, ironically, is Clean Air Day. We will continue to be there to fight climate change and to protect Canadians in every necessary way. The Honourable Member for Laurentide Labelle. Mr. Speaker, it's very hard to get the truth about the matter of foreign interference. The Prime Minister is refusing to tell the truth. He is trying to drag opposition leaders into his secrets. And most shocking of all, David Johnston admitted that he also didn't have access to the whole truth before, concluded that, before concluding that we don't need a public inquiry. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has two options. He either dismisses Mr. Johnston and seriously considers a public inquiry, or he confirms that the entire process is an attempt to hide the truth. Which will he choose? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I have already answered this question. I spoke to Premier Legault this weekend, and mayors of various communities and indigenous communities in Quebec affected by the forest fires. And I would like to reassure them that the Canadian Armed Forces will continue to be there for Quebecers who fear for their lives, for their homes, their communities. We will be there and continue to work closely with the provincial government on Canadians' priorities and Quebecers' priorities, people who are watching their country burn. We will continue to fight climate change and talk about what really matters. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Après huit ans de ce premier... After eight years of this Prime Minister, the debt level for our families is the highest in the G step, G7. The International Monetary Fund has indicated that Canada is facing the highest risk among developed countries when it comes to mortgage defaults. The Prime Minister is causing interest rates to go up due to his inflationary policies. He is forcing the Bank of Canada to increase rates. What will he do to turn around these inflationary policies and reduce interest rates before Canadians lose their homes? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Government of Canada is in a responsible fiscal situation, but Canadians are suffering. Meanwhile, what the Conservative Party is proposing is austerity and cuts to programs that serve and help Canadians who are suffering in order to preserve the federal government's fiscal capacity, but preserve it for when Canadians need help now. That is why we are investing to help families, to help seniors, to help workers, and we will continue to be there for people in a responsible and non-inflationary fashion. Mr. Speaker. We don't need another drama performance, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when theatrics collides with mathematics, the math 
always wins. And after eight years of this Prime Minister, the Canadians have a, a, a stock of combined debt that is bigger than our entire GDP. In fact, we are the most indebted families of any country in the G7. The IMF says that Canada is the number one at-risk country for mass mortgage defaults. Will he reverse his inflationary and high interest rate policies before people go broke? Here. Prime Minister. Speaker, I've, I've answered this question a few times, but the Leader of the Opposition continues to ask it because he refuses to go outside and see what is actually happening in Canada. Forest fires are raging. It's the worst year on record for forest fires already, but the fact is they are going to get worse in the coming years because climate change is is real, and yet the Conservative Party continues to stand against the climate action that we've been taking, stand against the investments that we're making to support families, to support first responders. They continue to stand against help for Canadians who are losing their homes, losing their families, uh, lo losing their livelihoods. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Has he really sunk into the low of exploiting these fires for political gain to distract from his inflationary and high interest yeah. rate policies? Yeah. Is that what Shame. it's come to? Disgusting. That he's so ashamed of his economic policy and record? I'm going to have to interrupt this because I mean, getting, I'm getting noise from both sides. I know you can handle it. Uh, you do that well. But I, what, I, what I need to have is I want to hear what's being said, and I'm sure both sides want to hear what's being said. I'm going to ask him to start from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister has just lowered himself to the worst steps to try and distract from his disastrous economic record. He's now using the forest fires to change the channel. This is even lower than I would have expected from him. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are going to sit down tonight to discuss how they're going to move into a small apartment because they're going to have to give up their homes after his inflationary policies have driven up interest rates on Canadian mortgage holders who have record debt. Will the Prime Minister keep the promise he made six months ago to balance the budget and bring down inflation and interest rates before folks go broke? Yes. Yeah. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I've answered that question a dozen times. And for the Leader of the Opposition to consider uh, that the forest fires that are taking people from their communities and destroying their homes are a mere distraction and not top of mind for people from coast to coast to coast is shameful. But the fact of the matter is he doesn't have anything to say about that because he refuses to put forward any real plan to fight against climate change and he does nothing but fight against our plan to fight climate change. If he has a better plan, let him say it, because we've been waiting a long time for it. But he has no plan to fight climate change. He still questions whether it exists while Canada is burning. The Honourable Member for Madawaska Restigouche. Order. Order. Can we continue? Order. 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 L'honorable député de Madawaska. The Honourable Member for Madawaska Restigouche. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canada is recognized for its rich biodiversity, but we know that both in Canada and elsewhere, climate change is undermining global biodiversity. This is Environment Week. I would ask the Prime Minister to tell us what his government is doing to protect flora, fauna and Canadian biodiversity. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Madawaska Restigouche for this important question and his hard work. Canada has committed to meeting its objective of preserving 25 per cent of our lands and oceans by 2025 and 30 per cent by 2030. The Kunming Montreal Global Framework on Biodiversity is a victory for all of humanity. Since 2015, our government has worked hard to protect an additional 300,000 square kilometers and protect endangered species, and that work is just starting. So, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister 
has caused the mortgage crisis we now face. Back in 2021, 2022, he flooded the economy with cheap uh, and excessive cash. That went into the mortgage system, it bid up the price of housing, house prices had doubled under his leadership, then Canadians were forced to take on massive, in some cases, million dollar mortgages in order to buy a home. He promised them rates would be long, low for long, but then his deficits juiced inflation, which pushed up interest rates. And now over the next three years, many of those same families will face 40% increases in their mortgage payments. How is he going to save their homes now that he put them in peril? Here. Right Honourable Prime Minister. 2021-2022. Mm-hmm. What was happening around then? What was happening in 2020, 2021? Uh, the investments we made to help Canadians get through the pandemic, the investments we made to support small businesses, uh, to support our frontline health workers, to ensure that we got through this extraordinarily difficult time uh, in one of the best situations with some of the fewest deaths of all of our peer countries. And the Conservative Party continues to say they would have done far different. They would have allowed people to be more vulnerable. They wouldn't have been there to support Canadians. Can- Honourable Leader of the Opposition. 2021, 2022, I'll tell you what was happening. I'll tell you what he was doing. He was trying to stuff a half billion dollars into the We Charity to help a group that had paid off his family. We, we know that he gave money to Frank Bayless's company. We know that 40% of all the deficits he added had nothing to do with COVID, according to the PBO. We know he added 100 billion of debt before COVID ever happened, and now he's adding hundreds of billions more now that COVID is done. So he's got to stop using the COVID excuse and start answering the question. People don't know how they're going to pay their mortgages. That's why I've had to ask 20 times about that question. Will he finally answer it? How will they pay their mortgages? years we've been investing in Canadians in targeted non-inflationary ways with things like a doubling of the GST credit uh, with uh, dental ca- uh, dental supports for uh, for families under 12 uh, with investments that have cut child care fees in half mr. speaker these are all things that the conservative government party stands against and indeed says they would cut and I ask you the, uh, mr. speaker and, and them through uh, how would cut programs for Canadians help them in this difficult time. Leader of the Opposition. Let me break it down. I've been trying with 20 questions to to get him to understand. Here's the domino effect. His spending causes deficits, which cause inflation, which cause interest rates to go up, which cause defaults. How do you reverse that? You stop the deficits, which stops the inflation, which stops the interest rates from going up, which stops the defaults. What part of that doesn't he understand? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, never letting the facts get in the way of a good political argument is the Leader of the Opposition's modus operandi. He says if we were to raise child care fees in Canada instead of cutting them in half, if we were uh, to not deliver dental care for young kids across this country, then suddenly inflation, which is impacting the world all over, <laughs> would suddenly drop. Uh, that Canada uh, is so important in the world. Uh, that our lowest deficits in the GDP are contributing massively to this global inflation context. It is complete garbage from the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker. fairly well, but it's deteriorating here. I just want to, I, I want to remind, order, order, order. I just want to remind the honorable members to use their words judiciously when they're using them in the House and try to use parliamentary language. The honorable member for St. John's East. Mr. Speaker, our government believes in that close collaboration with our provincial and territorial counterparts is essential. 
when we put partisan differences aside and the interests of Canadians first, anything is possible. I understand that the Minister of Rural Economic Development was in Newfoundland and Labrador last week hosting a federal, provincial, territorial, territorial meeting on rural economic development. Can the Prime Minister share with the House the significance of this meeting and what it means for rural Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for St. John's East for her question and her hard work. Last week in Newfoundland, we hosted the first ever FBT meeting dedicated to building strong and thriving rural communities. Joined by Indigenous leaders and rural experts, they discussed how to continue building a collaborative, coordinated approach to helping rural communities succeed. Whether it be on connectivity, on workforce issues, or on climate resilience, we owe it to Canadians to work together. When we do, we can make transformational changes to all communities, and that's what we will continue to do. Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Punjabi international students who place their trust in unscrupulous consultants in India have been defrauded and are now facing the devastating consequences of deportation. I'll be asking for a unanimous consent motion later on to support these students, but my question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister stay the deportation of all these students that are impacted and provide a pathway to permanent residency for these students. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are deeply aware of cases of international students facing removal orders over fraudulent college acceptance letters. To be clear, our focus is on identifying the culprits, not penalizing the victims. Victims of fraud will have an opportunity to demonstrate their situation and present evidence to support their case. We recognize the immense contributions international students bring to our country, and we remain committed to supporting victims of fraud as we evaluate each case. Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister is right about this one thing. Climate change is real, but the policies of the current government do not meet the requirements of the moment. We're in a climate emergency. Our eyes are burning in this place. The parliamentary Ottawa bubble has been pierced by the forest fires across this country, and yet in this place, the debates are inane. Please, will the Prime Minister commit to cancelling the Trans Mountain Pipeline protecting the northeastern slope of Newfoundland from oil and gas development now. Let's go. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my honourable colleague that it is unfortunate that in this House we continue to have to debate over whether or not climate change is real. It is unfortunate that the Conservative opposition still stands against any climate action. We should be discussing the best way to protect future generations from the impacts of climate change. We should be talking about competing ambitious plans to do even more to build strong economies, to create, create great jobs and fight climate change. Unfortunately, the Conservatives continue to debate whether it's happening at all. Here, here. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for question period today. I wish to draw the attention of the members to the presence in the gallery of the Honourable and